Well, it, it is my pleasure um, to introduce you, Amita. Um, I'm I'm so glad that we were able to snag one of our own with um, such a unique um, and uh, fascinating background. I think um, your experiences to date, as well as what you're doing now, is extremely pertinent um, given kind of the transition that the, the university and the school is going through as well as our department, um, as well as the broader energy transition uh, writ large. So really excited to uh, hear a little bit more about uh, the things that you've done and the things that you're currently working on. Um, maybe it's worth just reminding everyone that um, is online or in person that Amita is an ERE alum. I think it was... I think the department was called Petroleum Engineering at that point. Um, there's some crossover between us. Your your advisor was was Bill Brigham. Um, you actually followed one of the folks on um, my committee, Louis Castanier, uh, to Norway after after finishing your graduate studies. Um, ultimately, uh, worked with Amico and Shell thereafter. Um, I'll, I'll let you provide more details on some of the work that you did, but, um, you know, started in oil and gas uh, as an engineer, realized that you had stronger interest in um, kind of being able to better understand how to do business development in different countries and in new fields and new projects and um, kind of followed your, your nose or your interests uh, of, thereafter um maybe i'll maybe i'll stop there and let you let you take it from here uh but it's 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 so great to have you and i'm excited to hear a little bit more about um you know your views on the world i oh, one other thing that i will add um one other thing that i will add is uh, for those that are calling in virtually please feel free to drop uh questions that you may have into the q a chat um and then uh, Amelia um, or, or Sam, given that I am virtual, if if there are questions um, in the room, please please feel free to um, run point. Great. So, well, thank you, Usua, for the introduction, and it's been just such a pleasure also getting to know you as we've um, sort of prepared for this session. And um, so there's a few folks here in the room, so I'm going to kind of be looking, I think, mostly at you guys. Um, but no, first of all, thank you all so much for uh, having me be here and be able to share kind of my career path and journey, um, which I guess to start off with to tell you is really, uh, it's not by accident. It was very much by design, sort of how the 30 years of, of my life have have uh, progressed since um, leaving the school here. And um, uh, so I'm happy to share with you all of that. And I definitely wanna leave time for questions. Um, so please stop me at whatever point because I will, won't be doing the, the time check. And, and I think so you might have some things in between, but um, so if we're good, I, I can kind of walk everyone through a little bit my background, I guess, and and kind of what my journey's been since uh, leaving the department. Um, so overall, like I'm an explorationist at heart. So I always wanted to work in the oil and gas industry. I wanted to go find oil um, wherever that was possible. I thought that that was just a really cool thing to go do. And so I actually went to university when I was 15 years old and I went specifically to be a petroleum engineer. Um, and I always was very um, committed and excited to be a part of this department um, uh, with Dr. Aziz and Dr. War and, and Dr. Horn who were all there, you know, at the time when, when I was uh, coming to the department. So I, um, I came here and did a master's in petroleum engineering, very much focused on the geosciences side and doing um, you know, simulation design, 
for geological modeling, and then eventually how that you know progresses into reservoir modeling. So um, that's kind of my technical or you know science-based background and what I was doing here. My area of research specifically was on enhanced oil recovery and thermal recovery. Um, and coming out of um, the graduate department here, I definitely toyed with the idea of doing a PhD and just continuing as, as many do. Um, and I remember walking with Dr. Orr and debating whether or not to stay on for the PhD or not walking through campus. And um, he's like, Amita, there are two kinds of people. Those that wanna know a lot about one thing and those that wanna know um, about a lot of things. And he says, but I'm going to tell you that if you're going to want to be someone who wants to know about a lot of things, be really good at something, right? And I remembered that so to my heart that I realized I just felt like there was a whole world out there to be a part of. And I didn't want to necessarily just stay in one place. And I wanted to experience what that was. So I decided not to do the PhD and um, basically enter the industry. Um, so I joined as a reservoir engineer doing exploration or sort of reservoir development uh, work um, first in the Permian Basin and then in the North Sea um, and discovered my first uh, oil field in the North Sea um, offshore. And I was so proud, so happy with that, that I thought, okay, well, this is a great high. Now, where do I go from here? Is it just more of this or, um, you know, is, is there something else, right? And, and that's where, as you so have mentioned, I basically decided at that point, I had exposure to some of the challenges when you're actually trying to do new field development um, with government and regulators. And it's not just the science of, well, there's oil here to be, you know, developed. Let's go engineer it and develop it in the best way. It's actually getting all the approvals um, to, in fact, tie it in, tie their existing infrastructure um, and develop it in the way that you actually think it should be done in the best way possible. So in addition to that is also then putting together the investment proposal for the development. So it was great to find the reserves, but then now that we found it, who's actually gonna pay for all the kit that needs to be developed? So realizing that this was always such an integrated effort to realize um, you know, reservoir development, um, I decided to go back, I was, you know, um, I think still having the desire to be back, you know, continue my education. I kind of always had the fact that I left the PhD a little bit in the back of my mind. So I went back and did a, a JD MBA instead of a PhD. And so I did that at University of Chicago and my focus was all on um, the energy sector and in, in almost everything that I did with regards to policy and development. And fast forward uh, from there, basically, um, having qualified the bar, I ended up qualifying the bar in England, um, and effectively taking my career overseas, um, from 2000 onward. Um, so I basically lived, um, across four continents. Um, I was in the UK for a good period of time in London. Um, and then I did strategy and m and um, in London. So all for oil and gas in the energy sector. And that actually broadened me from just the upstream side of what I knew, right? Upstream exploration and development into um, the full value chain, right? Midstream to downstream, a little more gas focused rather than just oil focused and looking at what were really the drivers for cross-border investments, Middle Eastern government looking to expand in uh, Eastern Europe, um, European entities looking to grow either Africa, you know, LNG, or across Asia, you know, LNG sales and distribution. Um, so I got to really see that and play at a very 
meaningful level doing strategy, right? For those sorts of um, deals and projects and the pace of, of growth of the LNG industry, basically from 2000 onward. Um, so I did that with uh, Booz Allen and Hamilton for about five years, um, based in London and then based in Singapore. And then I um, basically had a family in that process, right? I um, had two children and I was traveling and working and I, I married, I'm a dual career couple. So my husband is working in the oil and gas industry and we, we were, he was with Shell, I was with Booze. And um, basically decided, okay, this, this pace of life probably isn't gonna enable me to be the parent that I wanna be for my children. So let me take a step back and rejoin industry rather than be on this whole M&A world. And I rejoined Shell basically. So I had been with Shell prior when I was in the North Sea. And so I rejoined Shell and led new business development for them in Nigeria. Um, why Nigeria? Uh, basically I was living in London in South Kensington and, you know, where everything was very planned and, you know, organized. Um, but we were trading off the children at the airport, right? And I realized one day, this is no way to raise a family. Um, so I contacted some folks back at Shell. They said, well, gosh, would you be interested in Nigeria? Now, Nigeria at this time, which it's hard to say fast forward, you know, 20 years ago was really, I mean, this is around 2005 and was truly just an epicenter for growth for LNG and both to supply Europe and, um, you know, supply Asia. So it was such an exciting basin. And I knew that. And I thought, well, I just want to be someplace that has that kind of a um, you know, development basin, both for deep offshore, there was a lot of, you know, deep drilling going on there. And it was, you know, truly a, a kind of a technical innovation um, place. So I was like, great. And this made 30% of the Shell portfolio, the reserves portfolio of Shell at that time was 30% Nigeria um, between their onshore and offshore. And so I was like, great, I get to go there, be with, you know, again, you know, in my quest to try to be a part of other places in the world and take my experience and contribute um, to our industry, I was like, absolutely, sign me up. My husband was not so keen. So my husband, on the other hand, was like, why are we going to Nigeria? We have, you know, a three-year-old and a five-year-old and you want us to all pick up and move. And I was like, yep, that's what we're doing. So off we went and um, basically I led new business development, all sorts of uh, new acquisition bid rounds. So I worked extremely closely. I was basically commercial for exploration team and, um, the broader business development team across Africa. Um, so I reported into the corporate center in the Netherlands and um, we did a lot of acquisitions, right? And at that time, you know, there was lots of bid rounds kind of happening and a lot of inbound investment to Nigeria from national oil companies like CNPC, ONGC, KNOC. So I got to be the forefront person representing Shell in those relationships with those NOCs. And that's actually what I think um, set the stage for me for the next 15 years of my career. Um, in structuring joint ventures and strategic alliances at the intersection of national entities together with corporate interests, um, and then in emerging markets. And when you look at emerging markets, you realize that money by itself isn't going to necessarily develop and achieve the kind of strategy that a nas uh, national entity um, is looking to achieve, right? So national objectives are very much, you know, linked to 
their people and you know development of people and education and healthcare and infrastructure and so when you come into a country as an investor either as an NOC or an IOC you are truly bringing a transformative energy to a nation that gives you a seat at the table with ministries and so ministries look how can we extract value from the kind of investment that's coming into the country, but then to deliver to the national agenda, right? Now, this is fraught with many challenges, as you can imagine, um, not only their own political structure, but also just not necessarily having the skills, capabilities in country to in fact realize any of those national objectives. So, my career now for the last 15 years has been very much about how do I effectively construct the inbound investment, enable inbound investment, but get that inbound investment to play a meaningful role collaboratively with various, the various, um, was that for something in particular? No. Okay. So how do you get them to, you know, structure effectively um, joint venture arrangements? Some people might call them public-private partnerships, right? Um, but it's uh, probably more aggressive than that because it's actually very much a structured investment program for either a particular piece of infrastructure, particular type of training or education or whatever the national objective or agenda is. Um, so I was doing that role. My intention with Shell or Shell's intention was for me to go and acquire more reserves and grow the reserves portfolio for Shell. But to realize that objective of growing reserves, again, it's not a technical only objective. You cannot realize the growth of reserves if you don't actually have a level of collaboration with your host government, with the place where these reserves lie, right? And this is more and more, it was already a challenge, it's always been a challenge, but before technology by itself was enough to get you in the door. It was a differentiator. It created a competitive position for you to come in and say, I'll bring the technology, I'll bring the expats, I'll bring the people, you just go ahead and I'll pay you a royalty, right? I don't need to worry about anything to do in your country. Well, in my career, what has happened is that is no longer the access to reserves in new markets, in new countries, because national oil companies like Petronas and Petrobras and uh, CMPC or, or any of them, or ONGC, are investing holistically, right? They're investing not just to access reserves, but they're investing to invest in energy security and they want to deploy their own people and they want to deploy um, their skills and competencies and grow their own nation. So the conversation shifts from reserves addition to energy security and energy delivery, um, which eventually then also gets you to, well, what exactly does that mean? What is energy security and what are the, um, the kinds of limitations and opportunities that exist depending upon which nation you're talking to? So fortunately for me, I got the opportunity to kind of be backed by Shell for four years in Nigeria to understand the complexity of this problem of energy security. And then, um, was asked by Exxon to uh, basically serve a similar kind of role for them, but at a global level. So where I was doing this at a regional level with Shell, I ended up doing this at a more global level with Exxon um, as they were looking for someone that could do commercial negotiations for Exxon Mobil Corporation in new, um, new markets and new entities. So, that actually, I ended up joining Exxon then and did that with them for four years. So four years with Shell in Nigeria, then another four plus years with Exxon. 
and I uh, was a lead negotiator for the corporation to um, either to for all new agreements, all either like even in existing operating countries, if they needed to add on some additional um, capabilities or do some renegotiations. Um, so it's kind of a small group of maybe 30 people in Exxon that go about the world, you know, negotiating contracts for ExxonMobil. And I was very fortunate to be a part of that group. And that took me over to Papua New Guinea. So to double click a little bit on Papua New Guinea as an example. So Exxon was investing, you know, the entire project PNG LNG is a $20 billion um, LNG development to train liquefaction. Now, so far, like definitely because of Nigeria and then um, the work at Exxon, my work more morphed toward gas and LNG than oil developments, even though I very much started from an oil background and was like, gas is just my product. Why do we care? So um, very quickly, I, you know, um, got really deep into the gas world and the integrated value chain of gas and the full delivery of gas. Um, so this was very much at the core of um, PNG LNG development, which had been a development that they had been trying to get off the ground for over 10 years. And finally, they were at a point, you know, they had made decision to, to do PNG LNG and it was a very complicated, joint venture structure. At the time, actually the most complicated agreement structure in ExxonMobil portfolio, because it was not 100% equity funded. It was actually funded with external investors, banks and lending institutions. So it was publicly financed as well as equity financed. So when you do equity financing, you can kind of call the shots and you can decide you know, what do I want to spend money on, not spend money on? How socially responsible do I want to be? Do Am I really environmentally conscious? My HSSE goals are, are internally set. When you do public finance, you are subject to the scrutiny of the public. Now, as we all know, in the energy transition agenda, this is all about public scrutiny. So at PNG, I learned effectively how to play meaningfully with a level of public scrutiny and still realize development, right? Development of hydrocarbons, right? Gas um, and delivery into the energy security agenda for outside nations. So it was going to be PNG, a country that basically, you know, was a pristine rainforest, was now going to be, you know, impacted by all the development activities for a major oil and gas company. Um, and instead of trying to go into the country and kind of rape and pillage and feel like, okay, let's just take out and extract whatever we can as a major IOC, there were so many um, social license to operate um, terms and conditions put onto this project. So of $20 billion, it is basically unprecedented that about $2 billion of that was to be spent on social developments. So I went over there originally to take the handover uh, from development into operations to uh, the commercial arrangements. And when you do that, you're actually needing to renegotiate some of those agree some of those terms and conditions because development wise you think about lots of things so that you keep everything at a certain you're bringing in the right technology you're leveraging global skills and capabilities when you are trying to operationalize things you want to use more local content local skills and capabilities, you want to establish training centers, you want to transfer skills, knowledge, and expertise from a global industry into the local industry. So there's a lot of shifting of those arrangements that happen um, that effectively enable these kinds of large-scale developments. Um, and that's where the ministry starts to get involved. So 
when I was doing that work for Exxon over those four or five years, I really built up a skill set to work collaboratively between industry um, centers of excellence and ministry national development goals. And this has pretty much been my expertise now going forward. Um, from there, uh, effectively, like that was another five years. And then about the last eight plus years, um, I've pretty much just been an expert in this space, um, worked with PwC as a strategic advisor to many entities, um, not only national oil companies, but uh, so I left Exxon because I, I loved what I was doing at Exxon and it's it was wonderful to be a part of um, the group that I was a part of and to just have all that capability behind you um, and, and be able to make really uh, kind of meaningful change. Um, you know, various projects, which, you know, I, I can get into more detail, but, you know, effectively started the National Broadband Network and enabled telecommunications for P&G under that social license to operate and on the back of hydrocarbon development, right? So this was something that was actually recognized all the way back to the White House in um, the U.S. by um, the Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea. Um, and was a feather in the cap of the project of, you know, the big bad oil companies going out to develop, you know, and ruin um, the pristine rainforest, but it actually was truly a feather in the cap. Um, this was a real eye opener for me that there was something very powerful here, that how do you combine um, business drivers with national drivers and policy and be able to say that there's, when I say national drivers, I mean like there's a whole area of science and, and deep technical capability that is needed to realize any of these kinds of projects. And often, you know, that world is not well placed to necessarily be an advocate for the kind of capability that they want to bring and it gets clouded under the demise of either you know the inability of national government to help realize that kind of um uh collaborative global capability that could come into a country so i personally decided where i wanted to play was enabling that and changing that dynamic by structuring joint ventures and strategic alliances between um, you know, institutions and governments and international oil companies um, to realize whatever these objectives are. Um, so fast forward, I did, you know, I I was part of basically building out deal strategy, what is called deal strategy in um, PwC. And I was a global expert for joint ventures and strategic alliances. Um, why PwC is kind of an odd question in the sense that they bought Booz Allen. So they bought the company that I was doing strategy and advisory for. And at this point, this is kind of how do you manage work in life? was I joined, I rejoined that and I left industry because now my kids were sort of in secondary school and they needed stability. And my life in both Shell and Exxon, I was pretty much on a plane the whole time, right? I was negotiating internationally, all the things that I wanted and, and moving as an expat. So and my kids were moving and they were changing curriculum. And, you know, so I kind of, we'd survived up through, you know, kind of all the primary school years, all those years. But I thought this is so unfair on them. Um, you know, by this point, my son had started school in Singapore. He, you know, went through British education, went back to London. We went to Nigeria. From Nigeria, he came to the U.S. for like a stint of a year. I mean, it was worse than a military child. 
So I, when we got over finally to Australia and I was supporting PNG full time, um, and then Exxon was like, okay, great. This has been great over here in PNG. You've done, you know, you've got things kind of good and stabilized. We've renegotiated what we need and operations is looking great. Um, all right, we're ready to move you on to the next project. So let's move countries again. And I was like, this just can't, this can't be the case. Like, I'm not going to Kazakhstan. I'm not going, you know, I'm not moving the kids again. So hence, I rejoined Booz Allen, um, effectively PwC then at that point, which is in strategy and, and look to kind of build out this deal strategy offering um, to play at this intersection. Uh, that very much led me into the energy transition quite deeply. So I'd say since uh, my time at joining them, I've basically been playing in this energy transition space. Um, and because that's formulated the national agenda effectively for many countries. And how do you how do you partner? How do you bring investment for either PE firms or, you know, so I worked very closely with infrastructure funds out of China, um, out of Hong Kong and um, out of Japan, enabling their foreign investments into either Australia or Asia more holistically, because I was based out of Australia and um, uh, sort of taking, leveraging everything that I learned, right, about working with national entities at Exxon, I was able to put into force there and kind of really solidify what um, is kind of a unique offering right now. And um, so I thought, wait a second, this is kind of unique. I would love to go back to the US. Um, my kids finished, you know, high school, graduated and decided to come to university in the U.S. So I was like, I want to get back home and come back to the U.S. Um, so I decided to come back and effectively, um, you know, kind of decided to start my own firm. I played for a minute in um, tech specifically um, and enabling tech uh, for the LNG sector with Accenture. And, um, but realize that this isn't just, I, I had more to give than just a technical agenda here, like just bringing digital capability to play. And so I decided to take a leave of absence and reconnect with, um, you know, some of the thought leadership around the energy transition and went over to Cambridge and to do a PhD in law never did a PhD in engineering. So now I said, okay, fine. I should go back to university and um, effectively spent a, a year and a bit over at Cambridge and working with um, centers of sustainability and um, the UN in formulating, you know, global policy for um, the energy sector. And, um, came back and and kind of in parallel with that started running my own firm offering this as an advisory service to private equities and family funds and investors looking to invest uh meaningfully in this transition um recently i was actually though like while i was doing that and kind of feeling good and thinking okay this is a great place where i can mix i came back to the department also to try to see how um, how to further leverage the kind of innovation that's coming out of the department here um, through the School of Sustainability, as well as the sustainability um, initiatives and centers of excellence at Cambridge. And, um, and basically tap, how do I take all those that great thinking, but actually bring it to the market? And um, so that's kind of the agenda that I was on. And um, I ended up being asked or was if I would be interested and just recently took up a role um, for Japan. Um, so now I've just joined JIRA. Um, I joined them just in the last few weeks um, under which JIRA, if any of you might be familiar is uh, I will just, for those who are not familiar, it's a 50-50 joint venture between two of the largest public utilities in Japan. 
um, Chibu and TEPCO, Tokyo Electric and Power. Um, it is effectively a birth child from METI. METI is the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry in Japan. Kind of like the DOE, they're not actually the regulator, but they in fact set the strategy for energy um, in uh, Japan. So they've put together this entity, which is basically Japan's energy for a new era is JIRA. It's currently private, privately funded between the two power utilities, as well as you know, uh, a host of investors um, and investment arms of the other major um, corporations in Japan, all kind of under you know, METI as the entity. So I've just taken on a role to basically be um, leading their low carbon fuels agenda, which is a global agenda to deliver low carbon fuels and effectively at the highest level, you know, get to CO2 um, emission free uh, by 2050. So while this vision is set at a national government, the they've set up an entity in order to realize the vision of the national government. Um, but this entity and actually delivering on that strategy, what kinds of assets should they acquire and who should they partner with and collaborate with? So I was just asked if I was interested to come and lead that um, agenda. So that's basically what I'm doing right now. Um, and very excited to kind of, again, continue to bring forth this kind of ability to work at the intersection of kind of the technology side of it um, with the business development side, because you've got to go acquire and, and play and have a voice, right, to play, um, along with obviously the government, you know, objective um, to realize a certain vision. So this is kind of where I, my journey and what I'm doing, but um, to tell you the truth, it really all for me has premised on the fact that I, I'm so passionate about the energy sector and I truly believe that it is a um, technology driven um, business, but rather than just, so I've used my kind of strong desire to be a technical person, um, to be a voice for that. And to say, how can we actually um, springboard the technology for, um, you know, the kinds of objectives that meet an, a much bigger objective than just shareholder value and return, or, you know, how do I launch a new project and then IPO it? And, you know, rather than that kind of gain, I'm really looking to kind of employ um, the deep skills and capabilities that we all hold to national objectives and national strategy development, uh, national development. So um, that's kind of been my journey. And it really has utilized all of these skills, uh, you know, and the law, the business and engineering side, which I think I'm just really fortunate to have done that. And I have a very understanding husband who is uh, willing to kind of take some of the leaps and bounds and changes with me all the time. It's truly been a personal adventure um, with him. He's had to change jobs a couple of times in order to make this possible. And, um, and so I feel very fortunate that I've been able to have kind of the family support to realize where, where I am today, but, um, but also feel like I'm able to kind of inform even my kids now who both, they ended up going to Penn um, and, you know, my daughter is um, on working in sustainable investing basically with JP Morgan um, at the moment. And, um, and my son is very much in the healthcare sector.
why don't why don't I get started? Um, and if, if there are additional questions live, please feel free to um to uh, to to coordinate that, Amita. Um, you know, I think one of the things that I was thinking about as you uh, kind of walked through your journey was the notion of energy security. You you spoke about that a lot. Um, and we've been talking a lot about that over the past few years with what's going on in Russia and Ukraine. What what does that actually mean as, as an insider and someone that has worked with a number of different energy ministries and nations? Um, what does that entail? And I think how does that inform your current role as you work um, with the government of Japan and, and, and the large utilities there? Yeah, yeah, sure. Look, like, sure. um, so energy security is something that I think is, is something to truly, it, it, it's like almost the other side of the coin from energy transition, right? So while we want to talk about, let's get cleaner and, and whatnot, but there's also a very big, important part, which is just getting energy to people in, you know, emerging markets and, and countries, you know, national development is premised on people being powered up, right? And having energy to realize the kind of tools and technologies that we just, you know, enjoy in other places, right, that have that infrastructure. So energy security, I think, has to be the balancing factor when we think about the energy transition. Um, that's how I think it plays. Now, what it means for different countries is 100% dependent upon what energy sources they have access to, right? So energy, so for example, Japan doesn't really have much for natural resources themselves to be able to generate, you know, um, energy. So they import all of their sources um, for energy. And either that be a coal or gas or, you know, what they're hoping to be more ammonia, you know, hydrogen based. So, but other countries that don't have access to water, well, they can't do hydro. Other countries that, you know, are far north of, um, you know, the tropics are, or far south of the tropics, you know, just don't have enough daylight hours in order to, um, you know, necessarily have solar power. So a lot of the solutions that we've, we very actively pursue in some markets um, to realize the energy transition just don't work for energy security. And so it's actually about how do you balance the needs to get energy with doing it in a clean, sustainable, responsible manner. And that's kind of how it's playing out, I see, um, on the global level. No, that makes a lot of sense. Is there ever, I, I'm sure of this, but I'll, I'll couch it as a question. Um, how often did you... Um, or were you guys working to balance the tension between um, economic development as well as us associated with developing and robust and strong energy system? I think it's pertinent today uh, for low to middle income countries as they're thinking about how to get up the development curve, the human development index, um, and yeah. the costs associated with actually putting an energy system in place that will allow them to do that. What, anything from your experience um, that you can share uh, that would be insightful for us as we all think about um, kind of getting everyone up the development curve as well as getting and ensuring that people and countries are doing it responsibly. Yeah, yeah. Look, like that's a big question. <laughs> You ask a question which kind of <laughs> really um, tackles a lot of different things, but um, so it's it's hard to give just a simple answer to that question is why I'm saying that, right? Um, because I think it really touches upon the full value chain, right? So not just the full, not just 
from upstream through to midstream, through to the downstream, like where we have infrastructure requirements that are so fundamental to being able to get energy, right? So everyone is aware that there's going to be demand, right? But that's just, you can only demand if you're actually connected in some way to sources of supply, right? Like, I mean, then only then can we demand. So just saying population, so a lot of demand curves are based on population, right? Well, that doesn't necessarily help this conversation, talking about population, right? You have to talk about infrastructure. So infrastructure is fundamental to this economic development and enabling infrastructure is I think one of the key opportunities for us as you know, developers of sources of supply to think about more actively building the right infrastructure. The right infrastructure is what will deliver this energy responsibly, right? Is are we setting all of the kinds of systems within a country, are we setting them up the way that we know them in in our environment today, which is extremely inefficient? Um, you know, our big roads, our big, you know, lack of public transportation or, you know, just we have so much inefficiency baked in to the way we live here today. And this is one of the things that I truly admire when I think about and I work with the colleagues that I'm now going to be, you know, more working with in Japan is because they've never had, you know, this sort of abundance of energy available to them. By definition, they work everything to a degree of efficiency that, you know, something that we pretty much sets the benchmark for the rest of the world, right? And they naturally, it's cooked into the way of life. And it's not cooked into our way of life. So when we think about other countries that don't have access to energy today, how can we already set them up in a better way so that hopefully, actually, they're not demanding what we demand today, right, for the energy supply? And that's all, that's truly an infrastructure question. But I think it is an imperative in the energy transition conversation to think about it whole list like through the whole value chain not just think about it because of well i want you know less co2 emissions well we have to change the way things are demanded and how it is delivered yeah that makes sense and then it begs the question of you know quantifying the the cost the cost of carbon you know whether it's you know whether it's socially or uh from a business perspective just in your experience, how can um, how can you know corporate social responsibility um, both make visible and make intrinsic the the costs that society at large is, is paying for um, carbon? So it's been very interesting working for corporates and their corporate social responsibility teams that tend to be pulled together from individuals who actually, uh, I think historically, this was a business service. It was not a core service. It was not a core capability of the firm, of the corporate. The core capability was technology. The core capability were engineers, right? Researchers, developers, like the people that actually were Generate. So corporate social social responsibility was like an, an add-on, not a primary objective. So I think what I've seen in the last five to 10 years is that that's becoming much more of the primary objective of corporate social responsibility is becoming primary. And so what we're going to start, what I already observe is people who actually understand the complexity of this problem and can think in ways which are 
you know, outside of the traditional boxes and the traditional ways of working, people that are willing to either, and they, they come from every walk, right? They, whether they come from, you know, a business side or a policy side, or whether they come from a, a technical side, like I, you know, came more from a technical side where they're starting to have the conversations and set the agenda and set the strategy for the corporate is what I really see shifting and changing, right? Corporate social, and, and you know, hats off to the national governments that actually made that be the case, right? Because I feel like national governments, um, you know, are the ones that are saying, well, unless you're bringing to me, you know, your approach for social responsibility and national development, I don't want to work with you. You're not a partner of choice. So originally I used to call this like becoming a partner of choice um, as a corporate. And now I feel like that's almost just, you know, we're in version 2.0 of that, which everyone is talking, you know, social responsibility and, and building that into the strategy um, for financial gain and return and shareholder value creation, right? So it's a it's getting to be a much more intellectual conversation now because the problem is not a simple one it's a complex one and um so we need the right people sitting at the table asking the hard questions and being willing to come up with solutions outside of that there's a couple of questions here Uswa, in the in the room so i'm going to go ahead and take those mm -hmm. Good. Yeah, so you mentioned that you are involved in thinking with like and family. Yes. Also, you know, the other thing is that hearing more about like how does it involve me like bigger role and how does it be like that side of the business? Yeah. And how do you get the first pieces? How did I get the first, the first business? The first business. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so basically, uh, my role is is, is I'm an incubator, Good. right? For um, Mom, social. Do you mind um, Mita? Do you mind repeating the question just so those that are uh, on virtually uh, know what you're? Oh, you to. couldn't hear the question. Okay, so I uh, the question was very much around um, my own firm, Kingfisher Global, which is um, kind of describing how it plays with either family funds um, or LPs, like what part of the um, deal life cycle, I guess, are we, am I playing in? And then um, also how did I get my first uh, area of business, right? So that's kind of the, yeah, that was the question. So, um, so my own firm, I set it up to be as basically an incubator for um, individual, that wanted to um, play or participate in this agenda, right? Like in a value-based agenda for energy, right? Now, while I thought about that as being purely about energy, what I realized in kind of putting this out to the market and being um, available. So I had actually uh, connections with a few family funds through my work and, um, and as well working with national entities. So, um, some family funds, both here in the U S, um, as well as, you know, across India and, um, and a couple in Australia. So those connections, it was, I think individuals who had said to me already that, well, actually, you know, could you come work for us? Could you come work for us? And I was literally like, well, do I want to necessarily only work for one entity and help them do one, you know, deal at a time? Um, I felt like there was just something more uh, that they were looking for, which was a set of skills and expertise as to how do you build the business plan? How do you build out what this opportunity even looks like, right? What are the value drivers? How do you collaborate with either the incumbents and what, if anything, is going to be your competition, right? So currently my firm has been playing 
in two capacities. One is as an incubator to actually build out that business plan and think through it um, in a good way so that it actually can be funded, right? And then secondly, has been um, around identifying the opportunity space, right? A lot of people don't know what is possible out there. So for example, because of my um, engagement, because of my employment with um, major oil and gas companies, um, as well as with a mining company. So I did work for Rio Tinto in between um, leading growth and innovation for them as well. So I all double clicking similarly for them on um, the fact that they had divested all of their coal business. So they had about $5 billion in cash and they were looking to invest that in new energy minerals, basically minerals that serve the battery value chain. So I was responsible for copper and energy minerals uh, like lithium and where should they invest anywhere in the world. So being a part of their these kind of corporate portfolios exposed me to a lot of opportunities that are available in the world. And typically the kind of, uh, you know, independent investor, an LP or a family fund is not exposed to all of that, right? So being able to say, well, actually, I think that there's some opportunities in this country and this country, you know, how can I help you populate your opportunity funnel? And then once you're excited about one or two of them, let me help you build out the business plan and potentially introduce you to a couple of parties so that you can build a collaboration. Because none of these problems, like none of this kind of investment is ever done by one party, right? It's multiple. And a lot of folks don't know how to navigate the, um, the government side of it, right? And they're afraid of it. And they think, oh, well, we read about it and that's too difficult, right? And it's like, honestly, it's not that difficult, right? And it's so rewarding. It's so rewarding to actually, you know, make a difference, you know, in a country. So so because I'm so excited about that part of it, I think I'm like, let me help more people feel comfortable that this is something that they can they can do. Yeah. 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 Something to. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So your question was more around like to be, say it again. Yeah. yeah. Or local investments. So uh, the question was, am I going to focus more on local investments or cross-border investments? So I think it's always going to be cross-border investments. Yeah. I think local investing is definitely here, very possible, like very, I mean, that that's part of the agenda. The investment eventually is local, right? Because the business plan is going to be whatever is going to be local, but definitely the financing component of it is going to be cross-border. Yeah. So I think there's a finance and then a, there's an implementation side. Yes. Great. Next yeah. question. Yeah. No, no, no. I, are we okay? So are we good to take some more questions? Please. Yeah. Yeah. I have a few over here, but um, please. Okay. Good. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, that was a practical question. Um, I always like to draw on experienced people. And um, in terms of investing, twofold, if you were to give yourself an advice now, like imagine you were gradually now, but having your experience, where would you invest in your talent? Like, what is like a company which you would say is like, sustainable enough to go through that whole transition from say traditional oil and gas becoming less attractive and yeah. western countries. Yeah. Um so where would you place your I say scientific background yeah like in which field 
And the second question, very practical. I mean, I'm not having a huge, like, I'm not a private equity firm, but having a huge, like, um, equity to actually in this. But where would you put your money? Um, yeah. Like, your private your yeah. equity. Where would you, um, what advice would you give? I'm looking, looking, yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't worry, I was there. I was, I was 25 too, and I was like, what am I? What do I do? Exactly. Where do I go? Like, what is it? <laughs> yeah. So the question was, what would I do, like personally, if I was 25 again, and where would I invest? Um, so look. Personally, if I could tell you, I mean, honestly, you're 25, you're asking me if I knew that the company I just joined existed at the time that I was 25, I would have joined them. So I'd say, well, come join my company. Um, so therefore, uh, that is point number one. I think they, at the time I was there, like this wasn't even really a topic, Okay, none of this was a topic. It was all about like, let's go develop more oil, right? Like the world wanted, there's unlimited energy demand. Let's go develop more oil. I think what's so interesting and exciting now is the fact that you can, the capability that you have right now to handle such complex problems is the, we're so void of that, of people in the working world, right? They're so, everyone's so narrow. They know their swim lane. They're willing to, you know, they're very good at their swim lane. And, but the problem is, is that this journey to kind of actually make a difference is not multi, it's multifaceted, right? It's not single faceted. And so if you're someone who has, a desire and a humility about them to to be comfortable in environments where you don't know everything because I'm just going to tell you the majority of my life is the fact that I'm sitting in places that I'm not the one who knows everything right but I'm just wanting to listen and be able to kind of take my willingness to listen and my willingness to care to actually find ways to make collaboration happen and find ways. Oh, you had something really great to say. You had something. Why don't I just get the two of you together? And then, you know, something magical is going to happen out of that. So I think you have to be really comfortable with, and I, I kind of always was, but I definitely would say feel 100% confident in yourself. If I was looking at myself, I feel, I wish I could have told myself to just be more confident and, and be ready to just challenge things, right? I don't, you don't know what the outcome is going to be. Like all of this idea that, you know, if I was a private equity, where am I going to invest? What, what am I looking to get out of that investment? Right. I was offered a couple of roles with some private equities and I was thinking, okay, but I'm not interested in just making money for money's sake. Right. I'm actually interested in changing the dynamic and changing the dialogue. So I think you have to know that for yourself, that what is it that you are chasing? Um, so it's hard to say where would I invest if I was a private equity today, because it really depends on what the investors want as a return. Um, and my hope is to always kind of get, I think more and more investors are thinking about a non only, not only a financial uh, return. So I do think that there's an opportunity to um, influence that today. And if I was actually leading some of that, and I would definitely be putting it in the kinds of things that Right now, Jira is looking to basically funnel money into um, all things to do with energy. Um, the one thing I'd probably invest in would be hydrogen, right? Like I'm big on, you know, hydrogen and, you know, being a possible replacement source. I am also a big proponent of nuclear as well. So 
um, I would look for good ways to develop nuclear because um, I think those are the things that are really going to uh, change change the agenda. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot for your talk. Yeah. Yeah. Something like in the community and share their business. Um, I mean, right now in Nigeria, it sounds like share of a swing. Mm -hmm. Um, it sounds like it's not doing really well. So, I mean, like, I don't want, I don't, I don't, I don't want to say it's not doing really work, but it doesn't seem like it really works. Um, yeah. And, and I, I really want to Yeah. 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 Um, and like for me, I think you do, you know, it, it goes back to like, I still want to like have a that, like, that's really sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I've taken checks to the, um, I've had plenty of security around me while I walk in with a $300 million check, yes. So, um, and that's to buy oil and gas licenses, let me be clear. Like that was very much to buy oil and gas licenses, but yes, it's it makes you definitely worry for your own safety, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's what I want. Right. So, uh, there are a lot of decisions happening, and there's still very oil and gas for this economy. So, I want to say, like, the question is, what is the, what would you advise someone like me? They say I want money something and see yeah it's yeah in that place what do you what how did you it yeah do yeah well, is it, you know, honestly, it's a great question. So the question was, what does someone who wants to actually be able to go make an impact back in, you know, a country which uh, doesn't have all the things like Nigeria and is um, unfortunately fraught with a lot of com uh, conflicting objectives, how do you go participate and make a difference? And the fundamental thing I'm going to tell you, honestly, you have to never lose pride in how amazing the people are there. They are so amazing, honestly. Like the individuals are really intelligent. And, you know, like you, like, you know, people are, and if you can kind of foster an environment, the thing is, is that while there's so many things that don't work and that are broken, there are that many people who are extremely resourceful and so smart. And, you know, can make things happen. So the reason I say that is because it's so therefore, honestly, I think that where it's almost like it's so broken that almost anything that you could contribute with a collective and pull people together to go make it happen, you can go make it happen, actually, in Nigeria. So and the reason I'm going to say this is because outside of oil and gas, I actually got cerebral malaria in Nigeria. And I ended up being asked to be on um, a, a committee that would look at the healthcare provisions. And through that, over two years, I was able to effectively rebuild Reddington Hospital, if you're familiar with, and uh, Lagoon Hospital, so that both of them could be internationally accredited hospitals and serve a broader public, as opposed to Shell, Chevron, Exxon, just running their own clinics inside their own office for their own staff, right? Now that came all about because of the centers of expertise that exist in Nigeria, of doctors and professionals, and but just bringing them support. So I created collaborations between the Cromwell Hospital in London and you know the Apollo Group in India and. So 
you know, you can make things happen there. And we can talk about this more, but honestly, I just think there is no shortage of opportunity for people who aren't, are resilient and aren't willing to just kind of say, gosh, this is too hard or I'm going to be, because in particular, like the energy sector. Now, look, once you get to be of scale and once you get to be something which is like, okay, this is really, you start attracting a lot of attention to yourself in those countries. Then you have to think about that again, right? How do you protect yourself in in those situations so that you can grow at scale? But to truly make, you know, they say this is one drop in the ocean and it will, the, the ripples from that and the impact it can make in Nigeria or in West Africa or in any of those countries is, is truly amazing. So yeah, I would, I would say there's no shortage of what something, if you wanted to do it, to go do it. So that would be my answer to that. You saw, you said you had some questions. Yeah, maybe, maybe one to wrap. Um, and this this might be a little bit lower level than uh, the level we've been talking about over the over the past five or so minutes. Uh, but you know, you've been a lot of places and worked for and with a lot of companies. I'd love to hear your thoughts on culture, um, cultural fit, and ensuring that you find and you are finding the right environment so that your talents and skills could really flourish. I think. Um, yeah, I don't know what the numbers look like, uh, but I would presume, um, given kind of the macro economic environment, uh, um, there, there, there could be an uptick in, in M and A and I know, you know, the Chevron has one being, being the most recent, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, you've been a part of an M and A transaction, just curious to know how you navigated that specifically and how you've thought about as you've gone through your career, um, finding the right home so that you'd be able to pursue your interests as well as ensuring that the environment and structure around you is mm -hmm. um, appropriate to, uh, you know, allow that to happen. So this may not be the answer you want to hear to that question, but I don't think I ever felt like I fit. So I honestly don't feel... If I was searching for a cultural fit, I probably would never have done anything. Like, to tell you the truth, I, I think it's very challenging for those of us who, you know, maybe have a set of special skills, have had the opportunity to be in environments like we are here, like at Stanford, that, that you know, this is a bubble, like we create this bubble. And Stanford creates this bubble or, you know, any of the other universities, University of Chicago or, you know, Stanford, wherever I was or Cambridge, it's it's a bubble. Right. It's a bubble of people coming from so many different walks of life and the respect that we give each other and the way that we solve problems. It's truly a bubble. And there isn't really a company or a culture or an environment out there which is like that. And I think if you know that going into it, hopefully you're never going to be so disillusioned because don't ever, for me, I just, I had to stay true to who I was, despite the kinds of corporate cultures I met with, right? Um, joining Shell wasn't easy for me, right? It's a Dutch British company. I was an American and very few Americans do they bring into that company and to do international work and then uh, indeed lead new business development. So it wasn't, you know, because everybody welcomed me with open arms that that was, you know, a good role, really. It was, I was just committed to doing the job and, and being there that I didn't let the culture stop me from doing what I wanted to achieve, right? Exxon was worse, actually. I came into Exxon and while it was a great group and they have tons of opportunities to be involved with, I mean, it's it's very US-centric. 
right? It's a it's truly a US based organization. And they wanted me to kind of do all of these international negotiations based out of Houston. Well, that was kind of curious to me. That definitely did not make for a work-life balance at all. And so the entire culture of that company was like, well, why is this a problem for you to just jump on a plane at the last minute? How come you don't have somebody at home to look after your kids and to do whatever needs to get done there, right? The culture was not great. So definitely for me as a female, for sure. And then, you know, in the oil and gas industry, but then even in the roles that I was wanting to play in. So I just got to tell you, like cultural fit is, is truly a personal journey and how much you want to kind of, you know, feel welcomed. I never really felt welcomed anywhere. So I just kind of stayed true to what I wanted to achieve, I think. And it's kind of what I'm doing right now um, as well. So if I was to give any advice, I would say, yeah, know yourself. And obviously you have to, hopefully you've, you marry somebody or you have a partner who supports you and is that's your cultural fit, right? Um, and where you feel um, it gives you a platform to go and be everything that you want to be in all these companies, right? Um, I think it's important to look at the portfolio of a company. If you're going to join a company, understand what they're made of and what they're saying that they want to invest in going forward. I think that's how the bet, like they talk a lot about cultural fit, but I don't know. I don't know that you can even judge that without actually being in the company already. No, that makes a lot of sense. Um, that That's all the questions that we have uh, on my end. I'm not sure if you have any more in the classroom. No, but I do see my good friend, Anameta on this call and um, it's very late. Well, I don't know how late it is for her, but she's over in Denmark. So her and I were here um we were office mates here in this building when it was brand new so we were first occupants and uh i see her on the call so she's gonna have to say something and she told me she was gonna ask a difficult question but she better not ask a dis difficult question yeah, it's, coming, it's coming now <laughs> <laughs> no thank you so much for the talk amita it's been it's been really great to hear and i i um i really appreciated your answer to the cultural question the uso has uh question for the cultural fit i 100 percent agree and i think uh we've had much of the same journey um yeah in the old business and in the financial sector and so on and so forth and it's uh you're spot on yeah yeah, yeah thanks, thanks Anna Anna. Really talk. yep great well and i course, wanted to call uh, go ahead no i was gonna say of course you're you know the um, the of spade back in the Stanford days was a was a big thing for you and all this. <laughs> no, I was. I think it's been really it's been great following you and it's uh, and it's really fun to see it here. You know, I guess thirty years later when uh, yeah, uh, with all the things that you that you've done and I've uh, you followed your your interests and your passions and I and I think that's that's. Uh, something to aspire to for for everybody who's uh, who's starting a career. You know, you follow those. You're you'll you'll enjoy what you do. I guess. Yeah, yeah. No, thanks, thanks so much. Well, I wanted to give Anameta a call out as well. But um, look, honestly, she's another perfect example of like you know navigating a dual career, navigating having a family, a work life balance, and being in this sector. Um, you know, we both sat here writing our own, you know, reservoir simulators, <laughs> you know, and doing all the programming and and the work. And, and then we, you know, kind of both decided to go into industry and really, um, you know, realized, gosh, not everybody understands a reservoir simulator. So. <laughs> And so it was a bit of a, oh, gosh, how come nobody <laughs> understands anything I'm talking about? So, um, yeah, yeah. No, best of luck to to all of, yeah, the people that, you know, hopefully tap into this. And I hope it was helpful. 
I certainly think it was. Um, well, I'll um, I'll I'll just end by saying, Amita, it was such a pleasure to um, to moderate this talk, and uh, it, it would be great. I, I think Sam included your contact information on the bulletin. If not, um, folks that are on the line, please feel free to reach out to to me. Absolutely, to, to connect.